Hi, everybody. I want uh, to present you our lecture for today. Our speaker, Joseph McKay, uh, he will give you information about the uh, introduction of uh, gamification. Hi, Joseph. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, let's just share the screen to get the presentation. Uh, okay. Is that showing correctly? Yeah. So um, welcome to, as uh, said, today's session, which is an int introduction to gamification. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Macy, and obviously I want to thank the uh, team here at Responsible Gaming Foundation for organizing this webinar. Um, I also want to highlight that in this presentation, when I talk about gaming, I'm going to be referring to video gaming or digital games, not gambling, which uh, obviously will be uh, gambling uh, is, is how I'll refer to that. So a brief <clears throat> introduction to myself. My name, as I said, is Dr. Joseph Macy. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Excellence in Game Cultures in the University of Turku. And I'm also affiliated with the gamification group in Tampere University. Uh, my work, uh, my research interests uh, are obviously around what you'll be hearing about today. There's esports, video games. Uh, excuse me, the slide is going on automatically, and I don't want that. Um, I'll have to see. Hopefully, that won't keep happening. Um, let me quickly stop that and start the presentation from the way I want it to work, which is going to be a slideshow. Slide, here we go, sorry about that. So again, uh, as I said, my work involves esports, the convergence of games and gambling, uh, gamification, problematic consumption of media, that kind of stuff. Obviously, we'll be hearing a lot about that today. Um, I've worked with numerous Finnish non-governmental organizations concerned with problematic gaming and gamification, and it's still happening. That's going to be really annoying. I apologize about that. Um, and I also am part of a working group which has members of the National Police Board, the Audio Visual Association and the Department of Health and Welfare, which is looking at loot boxes and microtransactions in video games. So starting with a question, why are we talking about gamification and why is it important? Now, uh, in essence, gamification is uh, the use of gambling uh either as an idea or, or as an activity to drive or elicit certain behaviors and reactions in the parts of consumers uh, or indeed users this can be users of a system of a service or of a product and this is a uh, system services and products where gambling is not normally present so examples range from loot boxes in video games to augmented reality lotteries and instant win games on smartphones. Now, uh, gamification is becoming more and more evident across a range of contexts, uh, both physical and more commonly digital. And while gamification can be used to achieve pro-social aims, such as encouraging recycling or, or reducing fare dodging on public transport, it's often used to drive profitability and uh, or indeed to increase user engagement. So as such, there's concerns about the, the going, growing presence of gambling and of gamified interactions in everyday life. Now, these concerns range from normalization of gambling to the exploitation of individuals by companies. Now, in order to properly explore this issue of gamification, this pres presentation will address a number uh, of different areas. So first off, I'm going to start with a kind of a historical overview of convergence and how it relates to gamification. Uh, I'll then go on to discuss gamification in, in reference to the specific context of digital games, which offers a really good kind of case 
an example of, of how to discuss these issues. And then finally, there's going to be a discussion of gamification in reference to the more well-known phenomenon of gamification before opening up then for any further questions and discussion. Now, I'm sorry, but this is really uh, annoying me, the fact that the slides are continually changing without me pressing the button. So you have to forgive me whilst I quickly try once more to sort this out. Well, I'm just going to have to deal with it. I apologize. Okay, so although it's only recently that gamification is receiving increased attention, the logics under, underlying the phenomenon aren't new at all. Indeed, they've been present in varying forms uh, around the world for, for many years and even centuries. However, it's the recent developments in digital technologies which have provided a, a greater opportunity and impetus for the spread of gamification and the area of video games is in particular a, a hotbed of innovation and it's really given rise to the study of the convergence between games and gambling. Indeed it's this concept of convergence which provides the basis for understanding and, and interpreting gamification both as a concept and as a practice. Now when I talk of convergence I'm referring to uh, Henry Jenkins uh, work in uh, the public in his book Convergence Culture from 2006. So again what is convergence? Well uh, there's many different facets of convergence and we're going to use the the lens of media convergence as the primary focus. Now the process of media convergence is one where traditional distinctions be between forms and characteristics are becoming increasingly blurred. And more than this, this, this blurring of, of boundaries also gives rise to new relationships, new kinds of behaviors. Um, convergence is also a bi-directional process. On one hand, it comes from content producers who are trying to push content across multiple media formats. Uh, and on the other hand, it comes from the consumers themselves who expressing their own connection to a given product, uh, kind of creating content around that product. Now, uh, there's five different types of convergence outlined by Jenkins. The first is technological, which means the, the merging of technology, such as the ability to watch TV uh, online or play video games or indeed gambling games on, on smartphones. Um, there's economic convergence when a company controls several products or services within the same industry. Uh, for example, the entertainment industry, uh, you know, a, a single company may have interest across many kinds of media. So in, in this case, uh, we can talk about how uh, gambling, online gambling companies might also own social casino uh, game uh, games, and they use those as a way of kind of migrating customers from one to the other. Jenkins also discusses organic convergence, which is when someone's like watching a TV show whilst playing their tech you know, on their phone or exchanging tech messages or whatever. Now, this is a natural kind of outcome of a, of a diverse media world. Uh, the fourth type he outlines is global convergence. So this is the process of, of distant cultures influencing one another. Um, we have here uh, a photo of uh, the Indian Elvis, Shami Kapoor, and obviously the American Elvis. Elvis. Um, but this also can be seen, for example, in the, the spread of the influence of Vegas uh, as, as a kind of resort, as a, as a 
destination and how that has influenced the development of other kind of casino based resorts around the world. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, cultural convergence, which is where there's kind of stories flowing across different kinds of media platforms. That's one example, like television shows becoming films or even amusement park rides becoming films like Pirates of the Caribbean. We also have the kind of the migration of these uh, intellectual properties across different uh, formats in order to kind of um, play off their off their popularity. So here we have lots of branded slot machines from James Bond to, to Lord of the Rings, Rocky Balboa from those films. Now, another aspect of this cultural convergence is participatory culture, the way that the consumers are able to uh, comment on, annotate and, and remix uh, content. So uh, there's lots of emergent gambling activities, which we'll look at later. And YouTube as well is a really good example of this participatory culture. Um, and we can see there's lots of kind of gambling streams and, and stuff available on YouTube and on other video streaming sites. Now, there is also another model, which I'd like to introduce. And I think this is one that is perhaps a bit more relevant to the topic at hand, because in addition to technological, economic and cultural convergence has already discussed, we also have regulatory convergence, which is part of Balby's model. Um, now, it's important to note that these four uh, forms are simply a, a guideline for interpreting uh, convergence. They're not mutually exclusive. But the really important thing is to know, as I mentioned earlier, is that convergence and, and gamification, all these ideas, they're not new. They've been around a while. And a really good example of convergence is uh, seen in this picture here, which is uh, uh, some uh, publicity or news about the uh, electrophone, which is basically where um, companies exploited the new telephone networks in order to broadcast uh, operas, sporting events, etc. Now, this preceded radio, uh, as in the, the commercial radio broadcasts. And uh, you can see here that people, instead of dressing up and going to the opera, they would dress up and go to each other's houses and, and listen to the opera um, you know, in, in the living room. So again, a really good example of the, the kind of technological convergence and the new kinds of social relations that were resulting from that, uh, the electrophone has also been called the kind of the first streaming service. And as I said, this this picture is from uh, 130 years ago, I think. So uh, quite an early example of that. Uh, an example which is perhaps more, again, closely related to today's topic of gamification is cricket. Now, cricket uh, emerged as a, as a sport in the uh, 16... Uh, hundreds in the UK and the reason I flagged it as a, a really interesting example is that at first the um, cricket was was very localized each each village or each region had its own rules now this was fine there's nothing wrong with that but it meant playing across these boundaries was, was sometimes you know difficult uh, if you couldn't agree on the, the actual rules of, of playing the game now, this became a, a real issue when the aristocracy got involved because landowners would uh, arrange matches between their the team from the village in their land against the, their neighbours. And if they had different rules, then first of all, they couldn't compete. But also aristocrats, being men of leisure, like to uh, make things interesting by having a wager on the outcome. So again, wagering wasn't possible because how could you agree on an outcome if the rules were different for different teams? Now, this meant that they formalized the rules of cricket. And the main driving reason behind that was to facilitate regional competition and betting. Indeed, uh, Wisdoms, which is the, the, the rule book of cricket, to this day still has references to betting in the rules and the conditions under which bets are and are not valid. So this, uh, this kind of... Um, mix of, of games and of gambling uh, had a really obvious um, effect, as I said, with the regulatory requirements for the, 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 the formalization of the rules. 
but also uh, in, in other areas as well. So we see technological convergence. They they standardized equipment. They standardized the, the balls, the bats, the stumps, the distance between things. Um, it also had an economic effect because uh, landowners started paying the good players to just practice cricket and not work in the fields, for example. Um, they also uh, had this kind of uh, cultural convergence because this formalization of rules allowed the game to spread, not just within the UK, but globally. Uh, countries like India and, and, and Pakistan, South Africa, Australia, they have a real strong cricket culture and they have practices which have developed in those areas as a result of these these uh, these games and the importance of the games in their in their society. Now, the issues highlighted there in the discussion of cricket are equally significant in contemporary digital culture. Uh, a really good example is the emergence of esports. Now, esports is essentially competitive video game play, and it's one of the most obvious examples of convergence between video games and gambling. And this kind of role of gambling is perhaps uh, easiest for non-gamers to understand because it, it directly replicates this kind of uh, sports book style betting and, and the role of gambling in traditional sports. So you can bet on the outcomes of matches. Uh, you can bet on specific events in esports as well now. The in-play markets are developing. Uh, many teams and competitions are sponsored by gambling companies. Uh, gambling advertising features very heavily, not just in the tournaments, but also on, on websites associated with esports. Um, there's a huge amount of, of, of interaction. So gambling is making use of gambling as an industry is making use of esports, both as an activity on which they offer betting markets, but it's also a vehicle for promoting gambling. And we'll come back to this in the issue of gamblification. Again, the most obvious parallel is, is, is with football, uh, where many teams and competitions are sponsored by gambling companies, uh, and also where betting is a significant part of the, the culture and then the fan culture. Uh, but I think, obviously, this, this eSports is, is very kind of contemporary, uh, a really good example of what's happening now. But first, I think let's take a, a, a look at how the convergence of gaming and gambling has developed. Now, essentially, we can distinguish between two distinct phases, and the line marking this phase is the development of online technologies, which facilitated online peer-to-peer -peer gaming and also the streaming of video content. Um, this line also marked the, the division between the kind of casual informal gambling between friends and the beginning of, of more formalized betting via online sites. Um, uh, the first esports betting sites emerged in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, but mainstream operators didn't offer esports mar uh, markets until about a, a decade ago. So they, they took a little bit of a while to catch up. Anyway, in the, in the initial period of gaming, um, it was it was an activity which, you know, access was limited, uh, primarily uh, because of the the physical um, situation, the the physical requirements. So although there were home gaming possibilities, such as Pong, uh, the majority of people uh, access video games in, in public spaces, such as arcades. And these machines also then spread into other spaces, such as youth clubs, pubs, fast food shops, at, at least in the UK. Um, and also present in these spaces were slot machines. Now, slot machines have been around for over 100 years, or originally mechanical, but in the 80s, manufacturers started to include electronics and microprocessors which could affect the odds um, and, uh, and, and give a more kind of um, dynamic kind of experience. Now at this, a, at this time in the UK at least there were no age restrictions so gambling machines, slot machines and video games were available alongside each other. The 80s also saw the first academic investigations of the, of the potential uh, connections between gaming and gambling. Although this poster is from a, a later campaign, it reflects the idea that people thought that video gameplay led to an interest in gambling. This is primarily based on research which was conducted amongst uh, youth offenders 
and it looked at how how many youth offenders played video games and how many had participated in gambling. Um, obviously, there's certain problems with that setup, but at the time, that was uh, one of the, the, the kind of first studies that really looked at this thing. Also, in the 80s and early 90s, the structural similarities between gaming and gambling, gambling in the terms of uh, electronic gambling machines or slot machines um, in particular, so these structural similarities were the subject of research and, and they uh, identified a, a range of similarities, which included, for, for example, things like um, rapid event frequency. So lots of action basically being attractive and how the goal of the manufacturers, whether of games, arcade games or of slot machines, was basically to maximize the, the time that people are kept on the machine. Now. As the play of video games moved into the domestic context in the 90s, uh, late 80s, 90s, it was still limited to, to, to local environments, um, obviously mainly kind of homes and, and, and it, you know, the, the rooms where the computer was. And if you wanted to play against somebody, you essentially had to have them in the same room as you. Um, now, digital versions of gambling games were available to play on these home consoles. For example, here's a still from the Super Vegas Stakes from Super Nintendo 1993. And this was notable, not just that it included versions of casino games, but it also included interactions with other casino patrons, which made it more kind of game-like. You see dialogues and, and there's little missions and stuff like that. There are also lots of poker games available, mainly on PC and often strip poker uh, versions but they were very much tied to this kind of playful uh, aesthetic, playful approach. Uh, so that's basically the kind of the, the, the environment pre uh, in the first period. Now in the current period, so this is gonna be kind of like uh, from the late nineties, early two thousands onwards, um, technical developments, Basically, they didn't just change the content of games, although the games became more sophisticated, more immersive environments, but they also changed the way that games are played. Now, these localized spaces of play, arcades in particular, have, have disappeared. And, and also, they're no, people are no longer limited to, to playing in the home in the same room as, as someone else. So the, the kind of the player versus machine dynamic has become replaced with a player versus player through through networked online play sessions. These technologies have also allowed new business models to emerge, such as free to play um, and also new products such as social network games. And they've introduced these gambling like mechanics back into video games. Um, this is in parallel with the expansion of virtual economies and goods, which has kind of uh, ob obfuscated, kind of hidden the, the use of real money uh, in gambling-like activities in games. And as a result, these gambling-like mechanics are no longer so easily identifiable for users. This is all happening in an environment where the presence of games and, and game-like experiences is becoming more widespread, more ubiquitous. There's also a trend for increasing liberalization of gambling laws, general trend that is, uh, mainly in Western countries. And there's also increased access to gambling and gaming activities via the internet and mobile devices. Uh, here's some examples of the kind of the, the game gambling convergence I'm gonna to introduce today. And I'll go through these one by one. Um, but first, uh, to give an overview, these kinds of gambling activities, uh, these kinds of video game gambling activities can be uh, separated according to, to two distinct characteristics. First, you have a direct translation of existing activities. So for example, e-sports betting in sports books um, or using virtual items as stakes in, in betting or gambling activities. Or you have a, a more... Um, kind of emergence of more novel activities. Um, so ones which are directly related, for example, to esports or video games. So you can have um, 
uh, like skins lotteries. So this is kind of like a sweepstake, kind of like a jackpot. Some people have also likened them to slot machines. Um, you also have PVP betting, which is where people people bet, go to kind of like a betting exchange to play a game and, and bet on their own um, performance. Um, and you also have like uh, emergent activities, which are completely new with, with no kind of analog to these, these earlier games. Um, so what an example of that would be crash betting. And I'll talk about that more shortly. So we've briefly heard about esports, and I'm just returning there because, as I said, it's it's essentially formalized video, uh, competitive video gameplay, um, but it has a whole kind of stru sporting structure built around it. Uh, managers, teams, sponsors, as I said, the kind of the the gambling sponsors. In addition to sportsbook style betting, you also have fantasy esports in the same way you would have fantasy football, fantasy baseball, etc. Um, what's in, interesting is that research has shown that engaged esports spectators are more likely to participate in gambling activities, particularly betting. Um, that's, I guess, not hugely surprising if you think about the kind of the fan cultures around sports generally. Indeed engaged esports fandom full stop is associated with betting and more than any other activity um the gambling market connected to esports has been estimated to be approximately four times the size of the esports market itself which is also a ratio which is very similar to other sports um and uh, what is, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the first esports betting sites emerged in the late 90s. Now, these were all emergent from the esports community themselves. So they wanted to bet and there wasn't, they weren't services allowing that. So they made them. Um, and that shows you this kind of uh, uh, kind of cultural uh, convergence, people really, you know, kind of building these things for themselves. Now esports is available from many mainstream uh, gambling companies. Um, although I think Bet365 was the first uh, mainstream operator to offer esports market, it's pretty widespread now. And as I said the kind of the in-play market has also developed as as the data uh, on esports becomes more available, and the the companies are more able to offer these kinds of markets without <laughs> making a huge loss. Um, so yeah, as I said, the the esports e fandom is is a real kind of uh, really directly strongly associated with betting in particular, like traditional sports. We also have streaming as a real uh, important factor in the in the gaming gambling convergence. Now. Um, this is a still you can see the the reaction. There's lots of these reaction videos where um, game players, in this case a young boy, are opening these these loot boxes which have random. There's a loot box. The loot box has randomized content, and there's lots of as uh, so they've been likened to to kind of slot machines and stuff. And there's lots of these videos where people stream their reactions to opening. So if they get something rare and uh, then they kind of get a, a very excited reaction um there's also dedicated streaming services such as twitch tv now twitch tv is the dominant player in game streaming and it also facilitated this kind of mass consumption of esports content now on twitch it forbids gambling streams but you can still view gambling themed games now, the Twitch policy on gambling is, is kind of hard to negotiate, but the simple fact is, is you can find a lot of gambling games being streamed on Twitch, um, but you cannot view um, them playing slot machines, although you can play view them playing virtual slot machines, which is... The, the, the waters are rather muddy. Um, but anyway, in addition to actual gambling content being featured on the, the video streams on Twitch... They also offer these uh, tools to streamers, uh, which allow them to kind of increase engagement amongst the, the streamers' communities. 
and also increased monetization of those communities. Lots, lots of these games involve lotteries and raffles and uh, betting competitions. You can you can use the Twitch site currency bits. Uh, you can also get reward, these kind of social rewards. So streamers can can reward uh, viewers with special um, emojis for use in the chat window. They could also give them a role as a community chat moderator for a while. So there's lots of different kinds of rewards, but they're all linked to these these kinds of gambling like activities such as betting, uh, roulette wheels, lucky spins, etc. Um, as I mentioned, the the stream here is uh, taken from uh, YouTube rather than Twitch, and there's much more gambling content available on YouTube because the, the regulations or the policies are not so strict. Um, and there's been lots of dodgy practices. So people would stream themselves opening loot boxes on these kinds of simulation sites. But maybe what they didn't disclose to viewers was that they were also owners of these sites. So they were getting um, manipulated odds. And that was a, a scandal which involved a few streamers a couple of years ago. And there's been lots of issues like that. Um, talking about loot boxes, most people have probably heard of loot boxes. But just to give a quick summary, they originated in the, the free-to-play games of, of, of East Asia, of China and Japan, basically because lots of people were pirating copies of games, and so companies were losing money. So they made the games free to play, but they um, used in-game activities uh, to monetize and to secure profitability. Part of these were loot boxes, so you would pay to either access or to open a box, and the contents the rewards would be uh, randomly generated so you didn't know what you're going to get which is why they've been likened to slot machines now there's lots of different types of loot boxes uh, some are free some are paid some contain only cosmetic items skins which affect the way the games look but don't affect the actual play of the game however some loot boxes do contain these kinds of um in-game resources such as power-ups they might also contain uh in-game currency as well as said they use random number generation to distribute rewards and they can also they're very often time limited or themed meaning that you might get a halloween one for example uh or you might get a, a box which is only available for a couple of months and then it changes so the the kind of not only do the boxes change the way they look um, but also the contents change so the companies kind of artificially uh well i say artificially the companies are basically controlling the flow of goods so if something is rare or desirable they can manipulate it to make it even rarer or, or less rare more commonly available uh, they also limit the time that these things are available so it drives people especially those who have a kind of more like a collector mentality or if they have a specific item they want to get it drives them to purchase more and more before the uh, the the items no longer available. Uh, there's also simulated loot box opening sites available. So so third party websites, which basically replicate opening virtual containers to give virtual rewards, which then cannot be used in any other game. Now loot boxes are subject to ongoing investigations around the world there's been various attempts to regulate them obviously countries like belgium netherlands are the main examples but uh other countries like isle of man uh have also made judgments on, on on loot boxes um but there's a real discussion not just among regulators but also amongst players as, as to whether or not loot boxes are gambling whether they're a good thing or whether they're detrimental to the game playing experience what is interesting is that many gamers rationalize loot box purchases by saying, and other microtransactions as well, but loot box purchases in particular as being kind of payment to the company because the company gives them this game for free. So it's such a good game and they love it. They want to buy more in order to support the company. Uh, I mentioned skins. Skins come from loot boxes and skins they're cosmetic items as i said which affect the uh the 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 look of the game but not the game the way the game operates 
I noticed, sorry, that someone's put a question. We'll be dealing with questions at the end, so I hope that's okay. Um, so yeah, so skins are obtained primarily via loot boxes, um, although some games allow this kind of peer-to-peer -peer trading, like direct purchasing um, off marketplaces. And although the, the value of the market is hard to estimate uh, because of the nature of the, of the, the information that, that companies do or don't release, um estimates anyway of uh, by by market research company have put the value anywhere between two and 20 billion dollars per year just on buying these cosmetic um products now these skins which are transferable that you can exchange via a marketplace are also used as stakes in a range of gambling activities whether to bet on an esports match or even uh, to bet on on simulated coin flipping for example you can you can bet money on whether it's going to be a computer a generated coin will come out heads or tails very often these these coin flipping games are branded according to the the skins that are used so for example from a game called csgo as with loot boxes the legal status of skins is is gray <laughs> it's due to traditional definitions of gambling being framed around this kind of financial loss and gain uh, financial loss or gain and in terms of money or money's worth now people some people have argued that virtual items have no real world value therefore using them you know cannot be gambling other people argue differently um, one uh, kind of good example of the way that's developing is this uh, here which is called a VGO skin now I think these are no longer available but they were available for a few years and basically they were um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And they were one of the first kind of digital uh, commercial products to utilize NFTs. This, this example is from five or six years ago. Um, and they were developed uh, in order to replicate the experience of trading in skins and gambling. Now, they said that they could be used in any game that accepted them because they were nfts they weren't tied to a specific game but the 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 problem behind that rationale was that they were only available in one game which was not very popular and no no popular games have accepted these skins which is possibly one reason why they they died but basically they they had a, a value which was market driven um and is essentially used as a fiat currency and this kind of destroys the argument about virtual items not having value because although these weren't part of any game, uh, weren't available from any game, people were still buying them and using them to engage in gambling and to trade with one another. Um, again, the same company uh, also developed these these things called virals, which is supposed to be a... Uh, like a physical loot box really basically you would pay to buy a box and that it would be opened for you and the contents would be held in some physical warehouse somewhere in america and that you could if you desire request that they be sent to you or you collect them pay prizes inside range from trainers or telephones or tablets through to pencils and you know rubbish little plasticky toys um again uh these weren't hugely popular and they, they they stopped being offered after a year or so because people didn't really believe that they could actually access the the contents however some people bought them and some people traded them and it just shows that there's a real kind of market for this kind of of, of, of item potentially now let's move on to social casino games which again i assume most people here are are familiar with now they started out on social network sites such as facebook but are now available as, as kind of dedicated apps which you can download from from many app stores and they use the free to play business model to provide gambling uh, games to consumers so basically that means that uh, you have a certain amount of free spins or credits that you can wager or play these games, uh, but you obviously run out at some point. And 
these games allow you to purchase more credits with real world money. However, they do not allow you to cash out any winnings. So you're essentially paying to play a simulated gambling game. They're very often presented as a way of kind of practicing skills, practicing your gambling skills. Um, uh, but this is research has shown that the the odds uh, that are utilized in these games are usually much more favorable than real world gambling. So people may gain an inflated sense of their own ability if they practice on these and then move to online gambling. In fact, as I said earlier, many uh, online casino companies actually offer uh, own uh, social casino games uh, as part of their, their business, as part of their product portfolio. And they offer tie-ins and promotions. And there are very high rates of migration from social casino games to online gambling. Various research puts it between 20 and 60% of players. Uh, so yeah, they do have an effect. I also mentioned earlier PVP betting, where people bet on their own ability uh, to beat others in games. And these sites have emerged where you can basically challenge people uh, from, as you see here, things like these kinds of dual blitz or solitaire, also games like Tetris, these kinds of um, older games where the IP is no longer uh, so protected. Um, other games might involve like Tekken, like a, a fighting game, uh, which was popular on consoles. Now, this is analogous to informal betting, where you might challenge your friends to a game or, or others in a, in a pub or a bar to play snooker or something, pool. Um, but this is kind of uh, community-style betting. Now, there's not a, any really established site providers because many tend to kind of there's a high turnover but currently the big name is skills and this is mainly uh focused on mobile gaming rather than console gaming so obviously these kind of uh, casual games as i said bubble shooters sort of solitaire tetris etc a further type of game gambling convergence is simulated gambling now this differs from uh, social casino games in that they are kind of direct replications of gambling, but part of a bigger game. And so you can't necessarily buy credits or anything like that. You just have to partake in gambling in order to proceed in the game to achieve certain objectives or whatever. Uh, games like Grand Theft Auto, like you see here, or other games like Red Dead Redemption, which is set in the Old West with cowboys, they often are very kind of, they have a number of these kinds of mini games or, or missions centered around gambling. Um, however, we have seen in recent years a, a kind of merge between this simulated gambling and uh, social casino games because uh, in Grand Theft Auto Online, uh, a few years ago, they released something called the Diamond Casino and Resort Update. Now, what that meant was is they put a casino in the game and they allow people to, to bet in-game money in order to, to raise their funds in the game. However, they also allowed people to purchase credits with real-world money in order to gamble and to raise kind of in-game money. Uh, but again, they couldn't cash out. And this was so successful that in the two or three months after this game, uh, after this update was introduced, player spending increased by 23% in, in just three months, two or three months. And in an already large, you know, successful global game, that is a huge amount of money. Um, other games which allow this kind of simulated gambling with uh, real world effects was a game called EVE Online which previously allowed uh, players to set up their own casinos. And in that game, the, pay the owners of these casinos became so rich from people buying um, money and, and losing game money in their casinos that it affected the balance of the game because the, uh, the owners of these casinos effectively employed 
huge armies of mercenaries in the game to attack uh, another group of players and basically started a, a several year long war. So um, this sounds quite extreme and it's, it's, it's uh, hard to get your head around, but I really recommend um, reading about the EVE Online stuff. It's, it's quite fascinating. Um, in those game in those casinos in the game they could bet on all kinds of events not just you know fictionalized or simulated games they could also bet on real world sporting uh, events like football baseball basketball etc so it really kind of crossed the boundaries between what is a game and what isn't and then finally you also have um games which offer uh battle passes which is essentially a, a package of additional content that players can purchase and that supplements the main game. It includes things like skins and stuff, but it also very often includes gambling or gambling-like games. So Wheel of Fortune-style games or roulette. They also offer prediction contests or, or waging on your own performance. A particular game uh, where that is very strongly present is the Dota 2 Battle Pass. Um, and some games also uh, allow players to uh, bet on results whilst they're watching esports tournaments and then earn, earn money that way and earn gain money that way now the final category uh, of games I want to talk about now of, of gaming gambling convergence is these emergent games, games which have been basically created by the community the top picture there is a still from a game called RuneScape and this is a fairly old game but it's a role-playing game where it's like a fantasy game. You could be a wizard or an adventurer or a barbarian, whatever. And you build your character and you build your home and, and, you, and all these kinds of things. Now, in this game, players could purchase seeds to put in their garden to grow flowers. And these colours, the, the flowers would, would develop when they grew, were randomly generated. It could be blue, red, white. You never knew. And so players started organizing the flower game. So in the chat window, which you can see there beneath the main screen, they would uh, enter text saying, come to my house, let's play the, who wants to play the flower game? And they would bet in-game money on what color the flower would be. And, you know, they would then exchange the game money between themselves. There are other variations once the Developers stop this. They then bet on what color horse would uh, would if if a horse if you would um, breed horses, then what color would the foal be? Uh, things like that, all kinds of stuff. The cloak game, basically, it just didn't stop. They found all, all ways they could to exploit any kind of random event in the game to bet on it. The other picture at the bottom there is crash betting, which I referenced earlier. Now, crash betting is essentially a game of chicken. So what you have there is you have an exponential curve, which starts at zero and goes along like that. And you have a cursor, which moves along that curve. And as it goes up, it hits various multipliers. As you can see in the picture, there's 2.64 times your stake. Obviously, it starts at zero. And the idea is that the game will crash at any time. And if you're still, uh, if your cursor is still moving, you lose. Uh, so basically, the the idea of the game is to stop or, uh, whenever before you think the game will crash, and then you earn that multiplier. And uh, this guy has won two point six four times his stake. Um, very often, you don't win that. Uh, the game might crash before it gets to one. Um, and again, there's lots of video. Uh, streams of this online on YouTube. Now that's how kind of gambling has entered games, but we also see it working the other way around. We see how kind of game-like elements enter traditional gambling contexts. So with these uh, EGMs, these electronic gaming machines, very familiar to many people, um, they developed out of mechanical slot machines with the, you know, the introduction of microprocessors made them much more kind of dynamic. Um, now, presentation is becoming increasingly similar to games. There's lots of uh, cartoony characters. Um, 
there's also increasing amounts of these kind of narrative elements like these kinds of objectives and stories that take people through the game there's also lots of branding of, of popular franchises popular media franchises which include some games um some of these also have these kind of enhanced bonus rounds where you can play a game um in order to try and maximize more more winnings and they also kind of are developing these more game-like technologies with curved screens and stuff to to highlight and enhance immersion and there are also uh, efforts to develop more kind of skill-based slot machines so rather than just pressing a random and having the the reels or the simulated reels spinning there's um games we can start to now kind of maneuver the symbols once you get them in order to kind of solve puzzles or or, or kind of make new lines to win this is reminiscent of skill-based gambling which has been something which has been in the pipeline for a few years now basically turning successful video games into gambling games um this is a result or at least the idea of this has been that because the popularity of traditional gambling activities uh, amongst younger generations is declining they're, they're looking for new ways to attract customers and it's presented as a merger of video games and gambling the idea being that skillful game players are re rewarded with more favorable odds current efforts haven't been hugely successful um mainly because the the uh, skill in the game isn't very well connected to the outcome of the gambling um i've played a few of these games at various expos and they can be very frustrating so currently they don't really appeal to either market so um but i i know that, that, that companies have been working on this for some time so there might be more stuff in the pipeline so we've talked a lot about convergence and particularly the the convergence of, of games and gambling and where does that take us now so because this this focus on convergence has really developed in recent years um the uh parallels have provided inspiration for more detailed research into the role of gaming and gambling in this kind of consumer interactions uh, first in the video games and then by extension into other areas of digital media now the the term gamification was first used <coughs> excuse me at least in academia in 2008 and unsurprisingly it originates in gambling studies now it was used to describe the way in which professional sport was increasingly being used as a vehicle to promote consumption of gambling but it also was used to refer to the new ways of participating in gambling, such as online poker and social casino games. It includes things for like the sponsorship and advertising, the use of sporting personalities and in, in adverts, um, as said, new activities as well, and the development of these kinds of in-play markets. Um, and basically, we can really see the importance of digital technologies, of, of transmedia content and, and, and uh, participatory culture in the development of these kinds of gamblified offerings. There's lots of uh, websites which are maintained by fans, lots of discussion forums, um, creating statistical databases, etc. Um, so... It's therefore gamification includes a range of practices, um, which include the addition of gambling to existing products um, or the reformulation of gambling activities as, as simple games. You know, for example, without the opportunity to, to, to cash out in social casino games or also the use of gambling techniques to, to deliver new content. Uh, loot boxes is an example of that. Uh, gamification can also include the uh, use of gambling imagery in order to elicit certain cognitive or emotional responses. So in the Vegas Knights hockey team in Las Vegas, they use the slot machine uh, imagery as a way to kind of heighten anticipation when delivering information uh, via the scoreboard. Um, there's also uh the idea that uh casinos 
can be very kind of sophisticated places. We, we think of James Bond uh, and very stylish and suave. Um, uh, if you compare that to these kind of uh, more underground gambling, which is shown in films, you know, for example, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, where it's all very kind of in these dirty, grungy uh, under, uh, underworld places dominated by criminals and stuff. So the, the way that gambling is pre presented can can elicit very specific emotional, uh, effective responses. Gambling can also be used as, as a way of kind of um, referencing kind of hedonism and enjoyment and also kind of conspicuous uh, displays of wealth. You know, Vegas is very often used in films and music videos and stuff to, to show this kind of uh, success lifestyle or kind of party lifestyle. So for the following uh, decade after it was first introduced, gamification um, wasn't really used that commonly. Um, it was only uh with the increasing focus on convergence of gaming and gambling uh that gamification started to pop up again indeed it's often been used interchangeably with uh gamification and convergence um but what is really clear is that since the term gamification was originally uh, coined it's been used without a, a real clear definition its meanings become much more vague so uh, I'm presenting here a consolidated definition, which uh, I published a couple of years ago now, or at least uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, after basically doing a, a review of the literature, I wanted to find a kind of uh, an umbrella term to way to bring these different uses together. Um, what I found is that gamification can be used to refer to, to two main themes. That's affective. So, as I said, employing these kinds of um, cultural signs um, and then effective, meaning the actual use of gambling as an activity. These are further divided into two sub themes. So in affective, you have the role of <coughs> eliciting emotions and feelings by using gambling. And then the flip side of that is that gambling is used to... Uh, things are used to normalize gambling. So like sporting events and that kind of cultural um, uh, value that is assigned to, to cultural, uh, to, to sports events, to uh, certain personalities or celebrities or whatever. Um, in effective gamification, there's two aspects. There's a uh, full fidelity. What I mean by that is that it's a direct replication of a gambling activity. So uh, roulette, game of cards etc and that's usually added on to something or there's partial fidelity where one aspect is missing the randomness is is still there but it, for example it might not require a financial stake to take part or you might not be able to access the rewards or at least not as money so again things like loot boxes social casino games uh So while these examples of uh, gamification, like the effective gamification of, of using um, adding on roulette or, or the partial fidelity one of, of a loot box or a uh, social casino game, whilst these uh, examples come from contexts which largely serve the aims of business, so by increasing revenue and also by in increasing consumer engagement, um, they can also be seen to provide benefits to, to users and consumers. So um, the increased uh, value that is afforded these experiences because they're exciting, they're enjoying, enjoyable. Um, you know, they, they have these rewards, even if they might not be financial. But as again, as I mentioned earlier, there's concerns that the increasing use of gamification can have negative consequences um first among these is the excessive and some would say exploitative monetization of users again the games industry is, is, has been accused of this people are often uh encouraged to spend considerably more than they intended or even that they could afford 
There's also a normalization of gambling as an activity. So that is increasing the acceptance of and participating in um, gambling based activities, irrespective of the negative consequences. Indeed, these kind of negative consequences might increasingly be accepted as normal, uh, as a normal way, you know, a normal, uh, something which you would expect to, ha to happen when playing a game, when purchasing a game. Uh, another concern is that gamification as a general um, phenomenon may lead to increased preference for risk-based interactions more generally. So people might be more willing to start risking money on volatile outcomes where they may or may not get what they want. Where they, but where also where they may win and they may win, may win big. Um, finally, the concern is that Gambling, which is kind of hidden or somehow obscured, leads to uh, impaired decision making, especially when there's a lack of information transparency uh, between the provider and the user or the player. Yet, gamification isn't by definition exploitative or inherently problematic. Indeed, there's a range of implementations where it can have positive, even pro social outcomes. So, the picture here shows a bottle recycling machine where the uh, people who uh, enter, uh, who put the bottles in, um, uh, there's a deposit on the bottles. This is common in, in, in Scandinavian and Nordic countries. Um, and you put the bottles in the machine and you get your deposit back. So 10, 20 cents per bottle. But in many of these machines, there's the opportunity to be paid in lottery tickets rather than in uh, cash. And um, again, the idea is to drive recycling uh, and, and particularly maybe among people who wouldn't be so concerned about it. Um, other programs uh, include uh, programs to kind of limit fare dodging on public transport uh, in Germany, uh, where people who, who buy tickets are entered into a lottery. Also, um, this kind of lottery was used to promote um, participation in vaccination programs in the US uh, during the COVID-19, the, the early years of COVID pandemic. And now <clears throat> in these cases, the potential uh, to be entered into events such as lotteries, you know, it offers this kind of extrinsic motivator, um, you know, the, the fact that they can get rewards, thereby reaching those people who aren't naturally inclined to participate. So, you know, arguably has a, a pro-social outcome. Alternatively, there's other sites such as this one here, which is called Way Better, which uses gambling to promote both extrinsic and intrinsic motivations in regard to personal well-being or fitness. The idea is that people sign up for the service and they bet on their ability to uh, successfully complete a challenge. And uh, if they do complete a challenge, they share the pot between all other winners. So if people say in the bottom one there, there's 300 players uh, with a pot of almost $3,000, say 50 people didn't succeed, but 250 did, that $3,000 would be divided by the 20, 250 successful players. So again, this is, this is using this kind of gambling and, and, and kind of like wagering mechanics in order to promote these uh, kind of beneficial outcomes. So understanding the processes behind gamification and its different manifestations can provide a framework that allows it to be investigated and, and, and catalogued and uh, evaluated, thereby providing perspective and, and, a, and a kind of point of reference that can be used to focus kind of investigation by different stakeholders um and it can also be used to increase value to to consumers and users as well by maybe changing the the balance of certain um uh, gamified mechanics in, in in these different services um it also has a potential to kind of if we understand these uh uh interactions it also has the 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 potential to kind of minimize potential for for problematic consumption or, or or negative consequences as a result of these behaviors um 
and this kind of use of of gambling as a tool to to drive certain behaviors and and, and to affect outcomes on an individual level means that gamification has been likened to gamification even some people even think that it's a, a, a subset of gamification now whilst it's true that gamification is closely connected to gamification uh, I, I choose to believe that it's a, a separate concept and not a specific form of gamification I think this is because first of all it, it has a distinct separate academic pedigree indeed the the emergence of gamification in 2008 preceded gamification. However, the, 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 the subsequent um, focus on gamification as a field has, it has exploded, whereas gamification has only recently become um, more popular, more uh, people have become more aware of it. Um, game, gamification obviously also emerged from gambling studies uh, with that specific scope I mentioned earlier. But since then, the scope has really widened and it's become much more multidisciplinary. That involves uh, human computer interaction, psychology, game studies, media studies, etc. So it's really widened in scope, similar to, to, to gamification, but in a different direction. Furthermore, gamification has been connected to this so-called like ludic turn of contemporary Western society where games and play are re increasingly significant, both socio-cultural and in economic terms. Gamblification, however, uh, I would argue, is more closely associated with the concept of casino capitalism, which was uh, introduced by in the book by Susan Strange. Um, and casino capitalism is the idea that volatility <clears throat> and risk uh, which is associated with financial resources uh, has changed. It used to be something to be avoided, whereas now it's, it's not only tolerated, it's actually actively embraced by lots of the financial systems. So uh, that really speaks to this kind of emergence of, of, of gambling as a, as a tool to promote uh, different consumer interactions in, in different environments. Now, in addition to the uh, the use of gambling in this way to, to drive monetization, uh, I also mentioned that it can be used to elicit emotional or effective responses. Um, I mentioned earlier the the kind of the example of James Bond in a casino, and we we the representations of gambling are really really important because. Um, they, they, they show us these kind of societal messages. So James Bond is associated with success, with style, with panache, and he's very often pictured in these kinds of casinos. Uh, even games of, 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 of Baccarat and stuff, which aren't so skill-based um, in comparison to poker, for example, he's the idea is that his personality is, is such that it kind of transcends these and, and is very kind of aspirational in a way um lots of other kind of representations of gambling can give that idea but also as i said gambling can be presented in a way which is very negative and it and it kind of elicits concerns now these concerns are really relevant for gamification as a as a phenomenon um there's also concerns uh raised to about gamification as well because they're both kind of persuasive uh, design um, approaches and the the concerns are, are around their potential to encourage behaviors which are potentially detrimental to individuals so in uh, gamification uh, people criticize the fact that it can be used to encourage uh, to exploit individuals motivations and encourage this behavior which isn't suited to their best interests this is very often brought up in relation to kind of workplace situations such as gamified productivity um whereas the ethical considerations around gamification are more focused as i've said previously on the potential to normalize gambling as an activity 
to encourage individuals to seek out these kinds of deviant leisure practices. Um, and again, you know, very often concerns are raised about the effect on uh, vulnerable uh, individuals such as young people, adolescents, those with certain um, prior problems or mental uh, health issues. Now, <clears throat> uh, there are further differences in the way that the that gamification and gamification work. So uh, gamification is very commonly used in uh, exercise, health and wellness, for example. Um, and this uh, app here is something called Zombies Run, which is a gamified application which uses this kind of narrative element, this idea that zombies are taking over the world uh, in order to kind of make exercise more enjoyable, um, gives you more of a kind of a thrill, whatever. There's other game, uh, gamified um, services such as Nike Run Club, which incorporates more kind of social rewards and competition to motivate users. Um, as we've seen with the example of way better, gamification can also be used to motivate users in, in health and wellness because it encourages them to, to kind of wager on their own success and therefore kind of complete the challenges. Uh, it's not just, you know, fitness, it, like losing weight. It can also be about reading more books or in practicing mindfulness, that kind of stuff. Another especially significant area where gamification is used is education. And the idea there is that gamification is used to kind of motivate le learners with, with the long-term goal of improving performance in, in, in learning situations. Um, again, it's very common to use strategies such as competition, achievements, um, but also collaboration as well. Gamification is less commonly incorporated into educational settings um those that i have seen are more about kind of promoting engagement with the topic for example um uh some universities courses politics courses have um uh, hosted these kind of election prediction contests where the prize might be a laptop for example but again this is very kind of short-term uh aims and short-term rewards whereas gamification is much more focused on the long term. Uh, indeed, uh, successful gamification has been found to be best served by kind of making use or gratifying these intrinsic motivations. Extrinsic motivations are used, but um, the, the primary success in uh, gamification is one which can successfully exploit intrinsic motivations above extrinsic. Whereas the opposite is true for gam gamification, it's more focused on uh, extrinsic rewards and the opportunities for individual gain. Again, there might be some intrinsic motivation satisfied, such as excitement and thrill, etc. But the rewards are the the more primary focus. Indeed, um, gamification has actually been criticised for focusing too much on providing these achievements, the, the, the points, leaderboards and badges aspect as a way of motivating users. Um, but they at least serve as a kind of meaningful marker of achievement. Um, the chance based nature of gamification means that the use of these markers, these points, leaderboards and badges are essentially meaningless because because if you go to the top of a leaderboard because you want a, a wheel spin and then you're replaced by someone else who, who got a better wheel spin, that doesn't give you any sense of achievement yourself or or, or, or any kind of, uh, whether it's collaboration with others to try and get higher, or whether it's competition to see who's who's better. Um, so the, the chance-based nature of gamification makes that, those kinds of um, tools are not so useful. So, uh, in summary, the process of convergence has allowed gamification to emerge. And as media convergence grows, so do the opportunities for gamification uh, to spread into ever more domains and to become ever more sophisticated. Um, although gamification and, get, and, and convergence are similar, and they're intimately connected, there are important distinctions. 
first, as I said, convergence is this more umbrella term, which incorporates a, a huge range of, of, of different aspects. But also convergence isn't simply unidirectional or, or indeed linear. Uh, it, it works in on itself, uh, like with the example of a of the Disney amusement park ride, Pirates of the Caribbean, which then spawned a TV, uh, a, a film series, which has then also spawned lots of these other media products, uh, games and um, adverts and, and, and merchandise that you can buy. And also, you know, the uh, it, 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 it feeds in on itself and develops new things which, which continually affect it. Gamification, however, and also gamification, but gamification is more linear. It's a process which uh, gamification acts on games, as we have seen. It acts on these other digital media. Uh, and gambling uh, and games and gamification, game uh, rhetorics and game logics are applied to other services in order to achieve a certain aim. So they're very much kind of directional and linear, whereas convergence as a as a concept and a, as a as a pro, um, phenomenon is much more um, uh, bi-directional, multi-directional, uh, much more ergodic. Now, um, this also means that we can highlight gamification and gamification as two complementary processes under the umbrella of convergence. And as I've said, whilst there are similarities between gamification and gamification, they're largely aesthetic or maybe not aesthetic, but much more kind of um, shallow. And they're derived from the shared root of games. There is actually many more significant differences in respect to both the underlying mechanisms that make gamification and gamification effective drivers of behavioral change. As I said, because Gamification is more uh, at least successful or good gamification is more based on intrinsic motivations over extrinsic and for gamification, the opposite is true. Also, many implementations of gamific gamification attempt to induce long term change or rewards, but gamification focuses almost exclusively on short term rewards and short term outcomes. Also, gamification can <clears throat> successfully employ techniques focused on social comparison or competition, but the chance-based nature of gamification renders such techniques ineffective. Um, the context of use also differs. As we've seen, education and learning is, is, is uh, a very productive, fruitful area for gamification research and practice. However, gamification is very limited uh, in this area. We can also see that the gamification of games is very well developed. I've given you a lot of examples. However, the gamification of gambling is less well advanced, although it's ongoing. Uh, a particular area for development, although it's not really the focus of today's presentation or the topic, um, gamification can be has, has the potential to be used to increase both use and efficacy of responsible gambling tools, for example. I think that's an area which, which would really benefit. Uh, finally, while gamification and to a different extent, gamification have both been criticized as being persuasive technologies which can be exploitative, they actually both hold the potential to be utilized in pro-social ways. And uh, I think that is where we will leave it for today. So thank you very much. As I said, uh, my name is Joseph Macy. My emails are there. And time for questions. I think there's a few here in the Q&A section. Uh, which was the order? Okay, so Antonio Donov asked... Um, do you think gamification can make learning more fun and how to set a boundary in order not to get far too far? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a huge amount of work on uh, gamification in education. Um, and 
it's not a simple answer of, of, of just making uh, education fun. It's also because um, there's this kind of shallow uh, idea of, of gamification and of gamification where you can just add a game to it and that makes it better. Now, successful gamification and gamification needs to be designed uh, specifically to achieve the aims of of the uh, of the course or the service or the product and so um when you're gamifying something or indeed gamifying something you need to think about how these um activities are serving to promote the end result so social competition for example in leaderboards or or kind of these tasks they may suit a certain activity, um, such as maybe testing knowledge, um, but they might not enhance the learning or the retention of knowledge uh, before tests. They also um, have issues with different learner types as well. So some people are, are, are good with competition and seek it out and, and are gratified by it. Other people, the opposite is true and it makes them anxious, so it might not make it fun. So these these techniques certainly need to be very well considered before they're applied. Um, the next question from Milena Sankarska, I think that's right. Uh, uh, so where would you set the line between social games and gamification and gambling itself? Well, I, I think social games are a form of gamification. They're, well, social casino games. Uh, if you're talking about social games, meaning these other kinds of games which are available um, on social network sites, uh, games like Mafia Wars or whatever, um, I think it only becomes gamified when it uses the aesthetics and logics of gambling like experiences so in that sense certainly not all social games um games like farmville and stuff like that they're not necessarily gamified uh, until they introduce these kinds of random um generated events like rewards uh, so the 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 reward is linked to this kind of randomness and chance uh, I think social casino games are very uh, obviously connected to gambling. And the, the line there is that obviously uh, with gambling, you have the chance to actually win, to, 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 to profit. But it's not just that, because um, these social casino games are also gamified in the sense that they're not strictly gambling. They're, they're kind of partial fidelity because not only do they not have the chance to cash out, the actual mechanics of the games they offer are very often not truly representative of real world probabilities. So these, these kind of the underlying um, uh, algorithms and, and then code upon which these games are built has been already designed to manipulate uh the outcomes to be more favorable to players. And that's one of these issues of uh, which I highlighted about information asymmetry and, and transparency between users and providers. Um, I, I particularly think that um, social casino games, uh, which are presented in this kind of way of practicing your skills are quite damaging. Um, but the flip side is that there is also some evidence that social casino games can help reduce gambling for example people with gambling problems um kind of pathological gambling uh, there's been some uh, research which shows how uh, some of those um, affected individuals actually use social casino games as a kind of as a way of interrupting their gambling online they use it to kind of um so that they won't go and spend money basically on, on, on real um, uh, online gambling websites. So, yeah, I mean, there is, there is a, there are lines to be drawn. And as with anything, it's, it's not a 
binary state that there's a, a spectrum and and different ways in which these uh uh gambling can be used um also for example in in um uh, social casino games because they're not regulated as gambling um they're not subject to the same kind of restrictions on promotion so very often they have this kinds of uh all this uh, images of money and wealth and stuff and and this idea that kind of success is easy which you're not allowed to 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 use in actual gambling advertisements so there is a uh, certainly different ways which these 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 issues of gamification are present in in uh, social games i uh, hope that answers your question uh Ralitsa Kromova, uh, how about the gamification of sport? Bookies take advantage of marketing opportunities and technological innovation. Yes, indeed, very much so. I mean, that's that's very much where the term gamification uh, first came into the kind of academic um, environment, as I said in that 2008 piece by uh, McMullen and Miller. And that was the, the kind of the original defined meaning of gamification um it's it's it involves not just the um you know the marketing opportunities but the the kind of the, the combination of it all um in the uk at least it, you can't move for for gambling adverts around sporting events and particularly these really kind of dynamic ones which you, you reference there with the technological innovation so you have adverts which appear during half time, which reference the game that is being broadcast. So you can have in play markets advertise about that specific game in real time, which obviously is something which is only possible due to the the, the current digital technologies. Um, and this the the ideas of gamification around sport are are being applied, as I said, in many other areas as well. You know, there's. Uh, Esports being the most obvious example, but um, there's there's gamification of of like these reality TV shows. You know, there's they offer betting markets on who's going to be evicted next from whatever the current you know celebrities in the jungle or Big Brother as it was. So lots and lots of these kinds of. Um, uh, cultural and public events are being gamified they're being used as a vehicle to um increase participation in gambling uh, whether it's through mainstream providers or more kind of low level i would say low level but more kind of um uh non-traditional providers such as uh, the, the tv companies themselves or newspapers or other media outlets which offer kind of these kinds of uh, prediction contests or betting on the outcome. And uh, Dian Nedev uh, asks, interested in the gamification of investing. There's a wide discussion about gamified investment products. And do you think it could be useful or threatful for young investors' intentions to get involved in that? Yes, you're right. There's been uh, there's been work about the gamification of investment recently, um, and I would say that that very much relates back to what I talked about about this kind of idea of casino capitalism, where um, the the tolerance of risk is not just it's not just it's 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 not becoming more tolerated. It's actually becoming more embraced and more presented. Uh, you uh, it, you have the traditional investment products, which could be People have argued whether they are or are not gambling for some time. Um, and, you know, the, the whole concept of insurance that, that started back in the 16, 1700s with Lloyd's of London, these kind of contracts could be seen as wages. But even with the the kind of um, the the traditional investment products, you know, bonds and, 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 and whatnot with the variable yields, uh, recent years have seen much, much more volatile uh, products offered I this isn't my area of expertise so I don't really know a huge amount about these specific products but they are they are offering much more um, volatile products meaning that 
you know the 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 range of potential rewards is much higher obviously we talk about volatility in, in games like poker or, or or roulette or whatever or slot machines but it also uh uh relates to uh stock market investment market as well um and i think the there's work by newell um philip newell in this area which i would recommend checking out because he's much more <laughs> much more of an expert than i am in that particular area um but by extension we also have you know the uh investment in crypto and that is if we're talking about volatility then the cryptocurrencies are, are certainly up there with any other product um and again crypto is also finding its way into gambling um both as a stake but also as a as a concept you know the idea of cryptocurrency casinos which are based on blockchain um so they're kind of provable and um more transparent uh you also have it moving into games like axie infinity which is called a pay to earn game where the the, the game items themselves are nfts and are tradable so um they also can be seen as a form of investment and, and even like i mentioned earlier these loot boxes and skins that you can get in games because they're um valued based on rarity people have been in, investing you know it's still a massive product uh project but people hold on to loot boxes they hold on to skins which they think might become rarer because they they're, they're time limited and they're not always offered and then they would sell them uh, in years time for a few euros profit so this whole idea of investment is it is it not gambling that's one issue but um i would also uh, like to point you in the work of philip newell about this gamification of investment because um, there are much more volatile products and uh this as i said it, it speaks to this idea of casino capitalism which is what i think underlines the the kind of acceptance of, of gamification as a as a phenomenon so that's that then i hope i've answered your questions i didn't see more questions uh joseph thank you so much uh for sharing uh, your time with us uh, to, for providing uh, this uh, very interesting information it was a pleasure for us to be part of our webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, as I said, I'm also available for, to answer any questions. If you want to send me emails, uh, I had the email address up there. But um, if if you didn't have a time to, to copy it down, I'm sure you can contact Petra or someone else who will forward it on to you. Thank you so much. And uh, video from uh, this webinar you can uh, see in our YouTube uh, canal next week. Brilliant. Thank you very much then. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye.